Welcome back to Weekend Walkabout in our Gardens and Years Virtually from garden zorg I'm Janet McConovich. Stephen Nicola will not be with me on this particular uh, session that we're doing. We're talking about dividing perennials and we've add, decided to add a bonus chapter number four, uh, calling it Dividing 50 More Perennials. We had quite a rollicking live webinar with uh, at one point our uh, co-host daughter, uh, Sonia, who was working her way through the questions, said basically they want to hear about all the plants that you have on your list. Uh, and we hadn't really planned on fitting all that into the time, but we'll put that in now. So we're working off of, uh, we for the webinar, we worked off of this three-page outline, uh, which you can download from our uh, website at uh, on the webinar page under audience notes. There is, however, no list here like I'm going to show you now. It was all the plants that we had suggested to people. If you'd like to see examples of what we're talking about, we have these. And uh, people wanted to see them all. So we're adding it in chapter four. Uh, what we'd like you to pay attention to now, and the reason that you should have the outline uh, and take a look at it, is that everything boils down to four types of roots. Running roots, offsets, a whole lot of plants make offsets at their very base. Um, tap roots or layers. And as I show you these plants that I'll go through now, um, you're really just looking at four types of roots. And no matter what plant you dig up, if you look at the roots and say, ah, I see what you are, then you can divide it like you see it divided here. Uh, so this is the list that we're going to work our way through uh, from Yarrow. Um, actually, they are not in this order. Um, this is my uh, hyperlink list, but these are the plants that we're going to look at. Many of them are written up on our website in articles, and you can go to gardenatoz.org, and it's a searchable site, so you can, in our search field, put in the name of the plant and come up with some of these articles. So I'm just going to work my way through them. Uh, daisies, which are gorgeous plants that multiply like rabbits uh, very quickly, usually by the third year. The middle part, which was the mother plant, has died out. Uh, it made daughters. Daughters made granddaughters. And they continue outward from there. It happens very quickly. Um, they crowd out the center part, and the center part tends to get problems um, that cause it to just die back. So daisies should be divided every couple, three years in order to keep them really blooming and growing very vigorously. And they divide easily, take the clump up take the side pieces and pull them away from the rest. What you want to do is keep the pieces that have lots of roots from the outside edge and get rid of the center part that doesn't have as many roots, that's been more crowded, that has more discolored foliage on it because it's been around longer to be infected by the various things within, that can infect any plant that's been in place for a while. Ornamental grasses, uh, starting with the little guys like blue fescue which is a true evergreen, blue even in the winter, even in the spring when we've dug it up here. And like most of the ornamental grasses, it's growing by close offsets. See, each of these sections right here has its own roots at the base if you pull it away from the rest of the plant. Um, perhaps most easily divided by digging it out of the ground in the spring. Um, spring? Why spring? It's an evergreen, so it can dry out over the winter. Maybe better to do it in the spring than to do it in the in the fall, but you can do it whenever you want to do it. Um, but maybe easiest to take it out of the ground and then take a sharp spade and cut through the clump to make two different, two or three or four clumps out of it. Bigger ornamental grasses, here's Ann Hancock, who uh, was at the time that this picture was taken, was the uh, horticulturalist at the Michigan State University uh, perennial gardens, is dividing perennial fountain grass. She's got the clumps out of the ground and she's going to divide each one into four or five pieces and put back in one fourth or one fifth of each plant in where it was. Uh, if you don't divide, if you don't divide down to that level, if you don't, if you put in more than about a quarter of the plant you took out, based on how quickly plants replicate themselves, you haven't really divided it. It's going to be too big in no time at all. Um, her uh, uh, procedure for dividing is she's going to swing a, uh, an axe, a one-sided axe, into the clump and then drive it through with a mallet. Uh, another way to do it is to put a fork through 
You're going to push the fork straight up and down with the tines right through the clump, right into the ground below the clump. Put another fork in straight up and down, back to back to the first one, and then push them open so that they'll rip the clump open. Um, on the bigger grasses, sometimes you have to divide them before you can even get to that point. Um, this is uh, one of the miscanthus, it's zebra grass, miscanthus zebrinus, and uh, best divided when they were four, five years old, when you can still get the, the maybe two foot across clump out of the ground, rather than waiting to get to be four feet across and almost impossible to get out. Um, it's a very beautiful marking on the grass. Uh, little blue stem, which is gorgeous in the wintertime. It's probably Steve's and my favorite of the ornamental grasses and native throughout much of the um, Great Lakes and then over into the um, Great Plains. It's a, it can stay a long time in one place uh, and doesn't have to be divided so, so often as the others do, but it can still be divided and they're all going to grow like you saw the blue fescue with offsets. So this, this portion right here with its own roots can be split away and become a new plant. But this wedge is a wedge I cut out of a bigger grass. Um, and because the grass is so big that even digging a trench around it and trying to lever it out of the ground, you can't get enough cut underneath it because the clump is so wide. So I take on the outside edge there, turn my spade sideways and nibble, I call it nibbling cut hard into here. After that goes through, take your spade out, move in a little further, cut again. Once you get this first wedge out of a big clump like that, the rest of the wedges come a lot more easily. Um, so this wedge was maybe a twelfth part of the big grass and was plenty to put back in to replace that one grass. And all the rest just became extras. But there's the offset forming. People worry about cutting these down. When can I, can I cut it down? Would it be all right if I cut it down? Should I cut it in the fall? Should I cut it in the spring? It's a grass. We mow grass. It goes back again. Um, if it's getting unruly for you, I, I know a lot of people who cut them down, including one professor of, uh, well, of great renown when it comes to perennials. He's just cut it, just, you know, cut it down in June. Let it grow back so that it stays a little bit more compact for you. You can play around with them as much as you want. Bleeding hearts, you saw pictures of bleeding hearts and you saw the real bleeding heart earlier. Um, certainly wonderful plants. This is the old fashioned bleeding heart, Dicentra spectabilis. And this is what it looks like. Uh, you saw it when it, was, uh, when it would be in the fall. This is right after it finishes, um, when it's going, gone dormant for the, the summer, in the late summer. There's those buds, little tiny things, harder to break and snap off at that time of year. So sometimes it can be better to handle the plant then when you're not going to be bumping the buds off. The uh, smaller uh, dicentras, the smaller bleeding hearts called fringe bleeding hearts. There's dicentra formosana and dicentra um, eximia. So there's a new world and old world fringe bleeding hearts. They are, uh, they don't tend to go dormant, not unless the soil is real dry. So they're still there in the fall. Foliage is still there. And as they uh, go down in the fall or early in the spring, you can dig up the clump. They have a tighter clump. It's also offsets, but it's a tighter clump than the uh, old fashioned bleeding heart. So there are buds here, here, and here that can be divided off from the rest. You can see them, big, nice, big, fat buds. Um, tends to be kind of a hard crown to, to pull apart. No, I take that back. That's a mistake. Not a hard crown. Here's here's the. Uh, I mean, it, it is. They're connected here in a hard piece. But every one of these offsets that grew here tended to grow up to the side and is growing its own roots. You probably can see them here, coming from where the buds are. So you just crack off that piece. And you have a piece that's a separate plant. There's uh, nothing wrong with that plant, by the way. It's just a very, very dark, rich soil and was pretty moist. And you can see the new roots growing out of that eye. Baptisia false indigo, you saw this earlier to, to make the point that this is a very large plant. The 
can be in the ground for um, decades without needing to be moved. It took uh, well over an hour, I think about an hour and a half to dig this one out of the ground. And even at that, these roots are cut. They're still half inch in diameter and we're probably going many feet down into the ground. Um, it's gonna survive just fine. And uh, we have to talk about whether I would survive because we had to, had to saw it apart. I think I made six or seven pieces out of it. My son is clipping the uh, torn ends on the roots and getting ready to replant this division, which is one seventh of that plant. And it's a huge division, much, much bigger than you would get from a nursery. Because what do you do with something like, how many of those can you, uh, can you pot up into great big, huge five gallon pots and keep on the bench? Hibiscus, hardy hibiscus. Uh, you saw this earlier, they would grow very quickly, very quickly, uh, spread their roots very wide. Uh, the top of the plant is usually, you know, it depends on the variety, any place from three to six feet tall and, and as wide, and the roots grow that wide too. The plant though is a woody crown. These stems from this year, these are stems from last year, at the base of those stems, there are buds not swollen yet in the fall. They don't swell and come up until the springtime, but they're gonna grow from the base of each of those stems. So we just cut it back down to the ground and let the buds come from there. But this was an offset. This stem grew from that cluster. And by severing it here, you can take that stem and its roots and probably those old stems with it. So you get roots, stem, uh, root, roots, the section that the roots attach to, and then the section that the, of that root that the stems are attached to. And this is the big one that uh, well, you'll have, probably have to untangle from the rest and pull it loose. And there it is cut out, cut through there. Stems now cut down hard. Uh, put that back in the ground and it'll be a huge plant this year. This is a hibiscus that is not hardy in the Great Lakes area. This is in California where we were working. And uh, this is the same, really. It's, uh, it is a different species of hibiscus, but works the same, very woody. We've cut it down and divided it here away from the plant that it was attached to. It wasn't growing as well as it, as it should have been, which is one of the reasons we took it out. And that was because this root had wrapped itself around tightly around everything else and, had, and it was better to cut it off and make a separate plant out of it. And you can see where it's rooting off from the stems on the side there. That's how they make separate plants. They root and then uh, the buds above there can grow they layer themselves, or woody roots. Daylilies, um, most everybody knows that daylilies are kind of like grass, sod. You go out there and you just take a spade and chop a part out and you've got a piece to grow. Um, they are beautiful plants. They can add a lot of color to a garden um, of several different colors. But they're not, Steve's in my favorites because the foliage does not look good all the way through the year like some plants do. Uh, I'm taking these out in the fall to divide them and use only a few of them. Uh, they are offsets. There's the mother, call that the mother plant. There's the shoot. There's its roots. It grows off an, uh, a short uh, offset to the side. There's another one with its own roots. So this whole cluster is just offset on top of offset attached to each other. And that's a wonderful, good size division. It's got a couple eyes, a couple of main shoots to start with. There'll be more to come up afterwards. Every one of the offsets, this with its roots will grow. And with most daylilies, this uh, um, enlarged part of the root, this tuber will also grow. If you divide that up and put it by itself, it will almost certainly not bloom the first year, but will come up and be leaves that year. When you, so that one clump, you can move into pieces, break into pieces like this, spread the roots out. It tells you how far apart to put them because this daylily right here, its foliage will reach this far out this year. So by the time these come up and fill in, they will touch each other. 
put them into a, a shallow hole, put a little bit of soil in the middle of the hole so that you can spread, put the crown on it and spread the roots downward. When you replant, if you can put, if you can possibly put the roots to tip downward and not bend back up, the plant will grow better. It will root better with the roots trending down or horizontal. You tip the end of the root up and it actually slows the growth of the roots. Um, this is an example of using two forks to pull apart a big clump of daylilies um, to end up with more roots that cross that middle line and come out this way versus cutting, at which point you lose most of the roots on the one side and you end up with a lot of cut roots that really don't need to be in that clump. Another reason we showed you to divide daylilies is the reason to divide many of these plants. This, if it's a variegated daylily, it can revert and you need to take out the entire offset that reverted and put the other one back in the ground by itself. Otherwise, the all green leaf will always overgrow the one that's variegated. Another thing that overgrows are daylilies that run, uh, like the tall orange daylily that is used as uh, erosion control on the sides of highways and is often called the ditch lily. If that's mixed in with hybrid daylilies, it, because it has a running root, it's this wider leaf in here in among the narrower leaves of one of the hybrid daylilies. What it's done is it's offset, has a runner, and that has run over and is popped up in the middle of another clump so people will think because they had this group of mixed daylilies, they think they all turn orange over time. They don't turn orange over time, just the most vigorous of them runs into the rest, comes up and overgrows the rest of them. So don't put the orange daylily in with the rest of them. Blanket flower. I'm not gonna show you the roots of this one. We had the roots on the live demonstration. I should have shown those to you then. I hope you saw our live demonstration in chapter two. It was a lot of fun. Um, Gilardia is a long blooming, long time in the summer, just keeps going and going and going, but it'll bloom itself out and like daisies, the center part of the plant will die out. Oh, yeah, it's the mother plant. The daughters are fine. It grows by offsets. Oops, excuse me. It grows by offsets, but also in the spring and pretty much only in the spring, there are um, thin runner roots that just go out to the side a little bit, get a little, little uh, nub on them and come up as a separate plant. And at that point, you can divide off lots of little tiny plants if you go looking for them. But it's only in the spring, only when they warm up. Uh, bellflowers, I'm not going to show you there. A lot of bellflowers just make the point that uh, this one is a uh, clustered bellflower. Uh, that when they tell you they need to be divided, it can be a big job because this is this is one originally one plant that my client put into her garden and it's now covering about 15 square feet. Um, really, you need to take that whole center out that's gotten old, add compost, put new plants in it, or get rid of the bellflower. Um, but all of the bellflowers, including the more mannerly Campanula carpatica, the little, like blue clips and white clips, and Serbian bellflower, uh, even they will do the same thing where in the center it will get de depressed and tell you that it's time to divide. Uh, still bees, another plant that can stay a long time in place in the garden, are um, a, a real tight crown. There was a mistaken picture a while back of a still bee in with the dicentras. Uh, it's a hard crown. You, you're generally going to need to cut separate, uh, cut away a piece to have an eye and its roots. Uh, younger plants you might be able to uh, pull apart with your hands. If you have a very special one and you want to make lots out of it, every little eye will grow. See, there's an eye. I've just cracked it off from the bunch. It's got its own roots growing. See where it's growing from it. So I could pot that one separately, put it in a place where I can give it a little bit of extra attention to make sure that it doesn't dry out or get overgrown by something else. And bingo, you can have 50 astilbes from your one astilbe. But they do get old in the center over time, particularly if they're growing where it's a little bit dry. This is the Chinese astilbe that blooms later and drier than some other astilbes. And it's gotten worn in the center. And that's where the center is not throwing up many shoots anymore because those, plant, those parts of the plant, those offsets have no place to grow roots from the outside edge where this one was taken. Look at how many more roots and how many more shoots per inch there are. Hostas, um, 
center stops blooming so well, the leaves get smaller at the center. In the springtime, you'll see slow or no growth in the very center of an older hosta. Time to divide it. That might be 10 years on that hosta. I sent Steve to get a piece of a blue, big blue hosta one time. We were working in the garden and I said, why don't you go over to Burdett's garden and get a chunk of that blue hosta. We could use that in this garden. And an hour or so later, Steve came back and he didn't have a hosta. I said, where's the hosta. He says, I should know where to start. Well, this is another case like the grasses where it may be better to nibble and take a pie-shaped wedge out first. Um, I'm pretty sure that I did an article last uh, um, in the springtime for our website where we timed dividing and, and uh, renewing three big hostas like this. And it took about 30 minutes per hosta to divide it up into sections, get the stuff, the old parts out, get a good sized, good sized as in not too big, but healthy, vigorous clump and put it back in with lots of compost for each plant. Uh, they are offsets. Some crowns on some species of hostas are harder than others, but each one of those pieces pulled away can grow separately. That's a one eye division, one eye with three or four leaves on it and maybe a flower stalk. Um, this one is probably a six or seven eye division and that's a good size division to have in the garden. Um, there's a bud inside this, this uh, base of the stem here for next year and there's also more buds there that can come if something happens to this one or if it gets a good enough growing uh, fall that those get enough energy to grow separately. Bearded iris, you've seen several times today in other chapters, so I won't belabor them. They are rhizomes, uh, thickened stems that uh, grow along the ground. And this is what's called a fan. There's one rhizome that's had two branches. That's a good size piece to put in the ground because when one blooms, uh, when if it's just one piece and it blooms, it can rock back and forth and fall out the next spring. But when there's a Y, they tend to balance each other out. Uh, good size roots on it. Yes, you can clip those roots back when you put it in. Definitely when you're handling iris, taking them out in the, in the summer and dividing them or dividing them in the fall or the spring or planting new, take all the foliage off when you put them in. Just clip them right down. They're like grass. That's just the leaf that you're cutting. But uh, the more that you can get rid of the leaves, the more that you'll get rid of things like the, um, the leaf spots that they get and the iris borers that may be living on the leaves. And those iris borers eat their way down the leaves during the year and into the uh, stem, into the root. And that's the caterpillar of the iris borer moth eating his way in. And around him, her, there will be a place where uh, resting bodies of a bacterial rot get in and rot the, tr the rot the rhizome, which is disgusting. It's squishy and soft and smelly, and and it spreads in your uh, irises, and they don't grow very well. You'll see scraped marks on the leaf where iris borers have been working, and quite often a scrape right down the outside edge as they work their way down into the bottom. Siberian irises and Japanese irises and blue flag irises and Louisiana irises don't have the, the great big thickened rhizome and they're resistant to the bore, to the bacterial rot that the borer brings, but they can still get borer. And although they live a long time, this clump is probably 20 years old in our old garden, um, it's also become dead in the center. Steve did this. I always wondered how it happened. Steve says, yeah, one time he went and cut a piece out of the edge, took the center out, added compost, and put it back in to see how quickly it would refill the area. My bet is that without adding compost all the way through, that's going to be a pretty worn out area. I'm not going to fill quickly. That's a good size division of a, a Siberian iris. We'll have lots of flowers on it after you put it back in. But their rise, their offsets, they're just very close, and the older it gets, the bigger the clump is, the more that the, the little fingers will spread out just a little bit more. They won't be so tight. The chorus is a, a close relative of the iris flag. 
this flag is in California that I was dividing and I cried. I cried a lot over this plant because I could not get the first wedge out of it until I finally gave up completely. When I sat down and cried and said, I'm never going to do anything with this iris. I stood up and gave it one more try and, and uh, then the spade started to bite. But you can see in the bucket how many divisions I'm getting from it. I put back in one division about the size of the piece you see coming out there. Everything else had to go. Anything smaller, anything larger than that, and it just would have been that big and unwieldy again next year. Monster, monstrous plant. Laura is a woody, uh, sh it's a shrub in the desert southwest. Uh, we grow it as a perennial in the uh, upper, uh, more winter, winter, truly winter part of the country. Um, but it is a woody root that if you dig it up and take a look at it, will confuse you, mostly because it's been grown in a pot probably and it's all pot bound. But there's the shoots coming up. Um, the roots, which are tangled up against each other, have grown off to the side and layered themselves. So this one has its own roots on the side. This one has its own roots. And so by taking a, in this case, a saw and sawing them apart, I have all these divisions, bigger and smaller, each with their own new shoot, their own roots. So the roots growing from there, the roots growing from there. Every one of those will grow and be a new Gora. And like all the rest of them, as uh, in the fall, fall, fall being one of those um, uh, variable targets in California where I was working here on this one, it was, it was uh, January and was a good time to divide. Plants were dormant, but you can see the new growth that's coming and the fact that it does get cold there, not cold, but colder so that uh, the stems are loading themselves up with antifreeze Peonies, we're asked a lot about peonies because everybody says don't disturb them. It's true, you can leave them a long time. You can take great aunt Mel's peony and, and uh, pass it on down to your great niece and nephew. Um, and the original one might still be fine where it was growing, but that doesn't mean that you can't divide them or that you shouldn't divide them. If you see that somebody's got one that's a type you want, go get a piece of it. Uh, so here I'm getting a piece of the white double from a client to give to her daughter, taking the plant out of the ground, put the fork in, I'm gonna put a second fork in and break them open, uh, uh, break it apart, because they're offsets. And I've just gotta crack this piece off from the rest. This one's got one, two, three, probably more than three eyes. And that means it's gonna be a good size division for next year, probably bloom. The eyes are already in the fall, this is the foliage is still on them, the eyes are already formed and already forming new roots. You can cut the stems down, which is what you need to do because you can see the discoloration on the stem. That's getting, it's, that's uh, following down into the crown and rotting the crown. Uh, when I take peonies out and divide them and people say, oh, they don't bloom after you move them. A lot of times that's because you moved them with rot at the base of the stem, which has gone into the crown. And as this bud comes up the next year, it picks up the spores of that fungus and is already infected, which kills the tip. And the tip has the flower in it and then it doesn't bloom. So you want to control the disease. I want a nice clean piece, cut off the bad stuff, take your potato, um, well, I still have one of the very old potato peelers with the uh, gouging tip and scrape out bad parts. Make it a clean piece and break off old, old stems or clip off old stems completely. Tree peonies and intersectional peonies are woody plants. Um, so I'm digging up an intersectional peony here, which is very similar to a tree peony. Uh, the ones that I've dug up are the same. The roots are more thong-like, more strap-like, and more uh, straight out from the plant, but otherwise everything works almost the same as a herbaceous peony. The buds are forming down there in the fall. I've dug all the way around it, and in this case, so that I could show you the roots, I trenched around it, loosened underneath, and then I peeled off the soil so you could see what's going on, and I could get the whole root system. It starts with trenching around and loosening around the plant. Oh, I'm going backwards, sorry. Um, same thing. 
And yes, you can move in and leave. This one is, I'm moving it in the fall, but we've moved them in June too. Somebody's building a patio, the peonies are in the way, dig up the peonies and move them. Um, generally, I stake them first when I move them in, in uh, leaf. If I'm not gonna cut them all the way down, stake them uh, and tie them to each other until I can get them into their new place. Uh, on the intersectional and the tree peonies, the big difference is that they are woody plants with buds on the woody stems. But on the intersectional peonies, which are crosses between the tree peony and the herbaceous peony, they also have buds down in the crown. And so we cut them all the way down. I mean, just like it's a uh, herbaceous peony, I'm cutting uh, intersectional peonies all the way down. They don't have to grow from these buds, they'll grow from those buds and they'll still bloom. To divide it, I'm putting a hook knife. This is what I call a carpet knife with a hook on it. They're very helpful for dividing things. I'm putting the hook between uh, two of the stems and cutting down to get this, base, this uh, stem and its roots or this stem and its roots or both. And you're gonna take off all broken roots because they don't do them any good. Just cut them clean. And you end up with a division. Peonies, tall species of sedum like Sedum Autumn Joy. Uh, maybe they're eight, nine, 10 years old and start flopping outward because there are so many stems coming up in one small area that they're uh, more lank and thin and weak than they should be. Or if this happens sooner than that, like in the life of the plant, it happens in the second year or the third year, chances are good that the, the, uh, there's a hard pan, that the, the roots are not able to penetrate down like they should, that they go down a bit and then turn at a right angle. They're just not anchoring the plant well. So if it's early on, dig it up to divide it and put it back in after loosening the soil deeper. If it's doing this when it's older, divide it and put back in no more than a quarter of the plant. Um, this is another thing that happens when the drainage is not good. This is one of the variegated ones and it's getting mildew, something terrible. Check the drainage on sedums. So here's the crown. It's tight at the base of every single stem. Every stem has got rosettes like that ready to grow. There's a rosette, rosette, rosette. And each one of those will grow as a separate plant or you can take a cluster of them, just cut with a spade and get those offsets that are in that section right there. This is from a Sedum Modem Joy or might have been Meteor that we divided in the fall, had lots extra, and we just threw them on the compost. In the spring, the client said, oh, my daughter would like some of those. So we went out and they're on the compost above ground all winter were these clumps that had slid down the compost sideways. Here's the base. Um, they'd slid down and were, this part was uh, on the downside of the hill and the slope went up like this. So this, the stems were coming up crooked, coming up for the light. So we just planted them that way, even though it made the roots crooked, we planted them that way. They grew in their own roots. And they were just fine, looked beautiful. I'm transplanting these, I, transplanted, I divided and transplanted these sedum morchins, they're purple leafed tall sedums in bloom. Um, and as a precaution, when we move things in bloom, when the stems are spread out and heavy like that, and the plant, you've just cut its roots, it's not gonna anchor itself as well, so we'll stake them. So I've got a stake by the heaviest stem on each side. I'm putting the stake in the ground, there they are. Just holding them up so that they don't rock themselves out of the ground until they get anchored. Some of the sedums that uh, are clump forming sedums like this include the lower growing fall blooming ones as a sedum cauticola, and it's still a uh, offsets in a tight crown and every single one of those guys will bloom, will, will grow, sorry. The ground cover sedums you saw earlier in the, uh, our presentation in chapter two, uh, they root all along their stems. I happen to like the way sedums do that, why they mix it up with others. A juga, I uh, don't have pictures of how it grows, although you saw Tiarella earlier with a, a, a stolen a stem that lays on the ground and roots as it, as it gets out from uh, away from the shade of the original plant. 
Andrika does exactly the same thing. This picture is in here to say, show you that it's one of those plants that it's variegated form. I think this one is tricolor. I've forgotten now, but it should be pink with the white edge and a little bit of green or blue on it, and it's reverted. You need to watch the sedums and dig out and get rid of the ones with more green. They'll overgrow the parts that are more pink or more white. Japanese anemone you saw earlier, one of my favorite plants. You saw earlier how the roots run as well as new buds come from here. So where it had one, two main shoots this year. Now it's going to have one, two, three, four, and what we can probably see on the other side, more on the other side. Plus its root has run off to the side and where it got out from underneath the shade of the mother plant. The buds on the root have turned upward and formed new stems. There's a new plant there. So this tangle that you've got here is this one growing out and up and out and up. Over and up. This is the, the I broke the connection while I was digging it out, but it was connected right there just outside the drip line. So you want more Japanese anemone and you don't want the trouble of digging up the whole thing, then just go around and spring is a great time to do it um, so that they won't sulk and make you feel bad. Just go around the edge of the plant, um, out at just beyond the drip line, go loosen with a fork until you find one of those shoots just coming up, reach in underneath, clip the root, you've got a whole new plant. That's it one of the little runners that you might pick up that way. And if you wanted to, you could just separate this part, and put this into moist, so the top part into the moist soil, those will grow their own roots from the base of those buds. Big leaf forget-me-not, one of my favorite ground covers, especially for drier areas underneath trees. Um, a lot of variegated forms. This one's variegata. There's also Jack Frost and looking grass and a glass and a golden one. They all tend to revert, so you've got to watch for the all green ones, and you need to take the entire offset that's gone back to green away from the variegated form, or it'll overgrow. These you can put out where you need ground cover, because they're great ground cover. Coral bells, ah, oh, shoot, I forgot to put, okay. <laughs> Coral bells often have this problem, where they're dried out, they even roll right out of the ground in the springtime. They should look much more like this even before they bloom. Uh, but when they dry out or when they are rolling out of the ground, that's generally because something was eating their roots all winter and they dried out. They're evergreens and they dry out if they have no roots. Uh, so this one should have a lot of white roots all along the stem. Uh, and this is an, an offset. It's kind of woody, you crack it away from the rest. But all winter long, these grubs which were smaller at the beginning of winter, and they're at their biggest now, about the size of about the size of a plumped up barley grain. That's a black vine weevil or strawberry root weevil until they hatch out. I couldn't tell you which one, but uh, as new roots grow, they eat them. They're like sheep grazing on the roots, and so you watch for that in your heucheras, your coral bells. Don't move that around. I meant to add in the picture that Stephen just took of the healthy coral bells we had live and didn't show you. But take my word for it that in the spring there should be lots of white roots, just like you saw on these other plants, lots of white roots growing from what are new buds all up along that stem. Cardinal flower is a, uh, a tight set of offsets. This is the cardinal flower. Growing through it is a thermopsis trying to uh, take over its area. And I've dug up this cardinal flower, not because it needs to be divided. They can go a long time not being divided. And they are not short-lived. Uh, that's, a, that's a myth based on uh, the experience of people who are trying to grow it not outside of its native range. It grows very well where it's moist and part sun. Oh, they grow wonderfully. Um, at any rate, I've taken it out of the ground because this thermopsis was growing right through it. And by taking it out of the ground, it's easier for me to get these invading roots out of the clump because they go right through the clump. If I wanted to divide it, I could just take a sharp uh, knife and just cut uh, a wedge out of it. I would have a lot of nice vigorous side shoots. You can see all the new white roots growing in the spring. This is uh, April, this picture. Lots of new white roots growing as the new growth. It's green. It's not 
those leaves aren't very big yet, but they're green and they just have to add water. They've got lots of chlorophyll in them and they're making lots of starch, and lots of new roots. And there's the Thermopsis with blue arrows. Bee balm, I love bee balm. I love the smell of bee balm. I love it that the deer don't eat the bee balm. Um, and this is my favorite bee balm of all time. It's called Violet Queen. Hard to find. Um, I grew ours from seed originally. This part of the cluster is 15 years old. This part is one year old. Same plant, just a division from here that I moved uphill. And this is the next year, just as a great example of why you want to divide plants, because the young plants are so much more vigorous. So it was one clump, one piece that I took out and just moved uphill. And it's blooming longer, taller, keeping its leaves longer, because this is so crowded. It's not a disease problem, it's just plain crowded and it's off right out. So divide things more often, get better plants. Works with indoor plants too. This is a clivia, clivia. Um, they bloom better when they're a bit root bound, but when it gets to where the pot's bulging, it's time to go in, look at it, say it's an offset, cut between them and tease out the roots of one piece. Uh, in our, uh, on, on the newsletter in one of the uh, PDF magazines, a lot of our news, a lot of our articles on gardenaz.org are still in their original magazine fashion where we would put 15 of them together and send them out once a week. So you download the PDF and in there you'll see a whole series of pictures of teasing these roots out. I know Steve was amazed, but it works that way. Um, so it's bulging on the outside. Um, same thing with a jade, cutting between the trunks, potting them up separately. Uh, Clydea just slipped into the wrong spot there. Banana plant inside, making offsets. Another offset. Take it out of the pot. There's an offset. You say, oh, I see what it's doing. It separated itself from the side and it's growing up on its own. So you can just cut between them. Cut between them, and then this is now the cut portion where you took the offset away. Hellebore, we saw hellebore already. You saw us dividing this in chapter two. Yep, we saw uh, you saw a live one in chapter two, and then I showed you what that looked like later on. So we don't need to look at these again. But they are big plants. They are very big plants. They can be enormous, like big old hostas. And this one we're putting we're putting forks into to split it apart. Um, it's part of a demonstration that's on pieces of it are on that fine gardening propagation video that we're a part of. I am, there I am wired for sound there on my butt. <laughs> Very interesting working with the guy all day long with a camera right in your face. Bulbs, all kinds of bulbs that you can divide and move around. Crocuses, daffodils, uh, Dutch iris, um, croco, uh, colchicum. This is the spring. You saw these in chapter two. You saw us moving these with flowers on them. Here they are with just all the leaves coming up in the spring. When these daffodils go back in because they're in bloom and I'm gonna divide them down to single bulbs so that I can spread them out over a bigger area. I'm gonna put them in where they were this deep. See, here's where the white changes to green. They were in this deep. When I put them back in, they're gonna go in this deep because I'm, I want to hold the stems upright and they stand up just fine and they live just fine. Going in deeper like that, colchicum, firmer bulb in the spring, just divide them apart and put them separately. Here they are in the fall, like you just saw. Crocuses with their corms, just like the crocosme that you saw in chapter two. Daffodils where stem is this basal plate and the stem has made an offset and you can crack that bulb away just like you do when you uh, take a clove of garlic off or a piece of a lily there's no hard skin on a lily and this lily is not a good lily it shouldn't be this dark but it's a very um, close picture to show you this is a scale of a lily and because the scale is attached to that basal plate, if I crack the scale off, I will get leaf and stem and the stem able to grow these roots. And so you have a separate plant. A lot of people end up um, cursing their 
their bulbous lilies because they thought they took them out when they got a little carried away with themselves and they just keep coming up. Well, that's because scales broke off and kept growing. They were just little and you might not have noticed them, but they grow up uh, quickly and take over. Pask flower, it's long been about my favorite thing in the world, it comes up very early. Those are daffodils and pansies blooming back there. Come up very early, followed by the foliage afterwards. And they have a tap root, which you can cut through and end up with separate pieces. This is one of the plants that we said, okay, we're dividing a bunch of them. We're going to leave the flowers on half of them, and we'll take the flowers off of half of them. And we saw no difference in the plants. It didn't seem to matter. See that root growing down like that. Very woody crown. Mums, I'm not going to show you mums. They're just like daisies. They're just Divide them more. Divide them, divide them, divide them. They grow better when they're younger. Coreopsis, you saw the threadleaf coreopsis earlier with its running root. Mrs. Moon, Mrs. Moon, golden showers. I've forgotten her name. Um, the taller one, Moonbeam was the first one, shorter, paler, more pastel yellow. Um, yellower, taller one but they're running roots that just like sod, you just cut out a section and they're all gonna grow. The tick seed coreopsis, um, a lot of hybridizing going on between the perennial and the annual ones to get to these different flower form, flower uh, color variations. They're the ones that I showed you that are offsets. You can break each one of those apart separately. Tall phlox grows from offsets and from root cuttings, root pieces that stay in the ground will will sprout up on tall flocks. This is too many stems. Once it gets to be this big, divide it. And if you don't have time to divide it in the springtime, cut off a bunch of those stems. So that there's only in this space, maybe three or four stems coming up. Each stem will be thicker, sturdier, bear lots of flowers. It'll still fill as much space, but it'll be a sturdier plant. So we divide uh, flocks down to this one. So we've got three or four stems here two or three stems here, that's plenty. That's going to fill a huge area. This is, um, God, I forgot your name again. It's a beautiful plant, but it's so prone to mildew and its center gets just loaded with mildew spores and, and uh, uh, leaf spot problems. So divide it where you only keep outside pieces. It's not leaf spot on the leaves, it's just all the dirt from the wet soil on my gloves. Yarrow, um, I don't have pictures of the roots for you. I'm not sure why and where they went. Uh, the red and the white and pink yarrows have uh, a runner, uh, they're quite vigorous and a little pathic. They'll actually uh, poison the soil for other plants if you leave them in place for a while. The yellow ones have a much more of a, a dense crown that you have to cut apart. Otherwise, they're offsets uh, and runners, and you'll tell when you dig them up what they are. Just like when you dig up blue globes, they'll still say, oh, I see what you're doing. You are an offset. See, there's a mother plant. Sets itself off to the side, grows its own roots, and then you've got an offset. Purple coneflower, offsets. So many plants grow by offsets. Um, so I rinsed away the soil so you can see this one with all of its lots and lots of roots here on the outside edge. It's a good one to break away from the rest and grow separately. There we go, growing its own roots. Has stems already coming up, plus uh, reserve there, buds there and there that can still come up. We always get rid of the old parts of purple coneflower because they can build up problems with leaf spot and uh, fungal diseases like that. Yes, it'll grow, but you don't need to be growing it. That stem has been there a while and has gotten some problems embedded in it. One of the problems that they get, the purple coneflowers, is a virus that you do not want to propagate and move around. You want to get rid of the plant. This is what the center of a coneflower should look like. It should be round and single, even as a seed pod, round and single. Whereas this one, do you see the double yolk? That's one of the symptoms, one of the manifestations of a leaf, of a, leaf um, of a virus disease called uh, Aster yellows. 
So when you see that, what you've got is a plant that is going to do nothing but infect other plants and you can't fix it. We have no cures for viruses. They weaken the plant. They cause the plant over time to get a stem will turn black and leaves will hang down and you'll cut it off and wonder what was going on. You should take the whole plant out. Columbine you saw earlier is a taproot and here maybe closer you can see the buds on the root. Every one of those will grow if you release it. So we cut down through the center so that each one has a little more space to grow and they grow. Uh, Sangfoil, the, the shrubby potentillas, uh, sorry, the, the herbaceous potentillas, this one's Himalayan sangfoil, potentilla Himalayansi, nice silvery leaves on it and orangey flowers. It's a tight offset, take a knife and separate it away from the rest. And I get a division that is like so with its own roots. Balloon flower, you saw earlier, tap root. We're going to divide to get the stem with its root. Sometimes you have to do a little untangling. Sometimes you got to sacrifice some buds to go through it, but you get a nice division. Got at least two stems coming up, maybe four or five over there. This is during the year. The one was dormant. Well, as dormant as plants ever get. Turtle head you saw earlier. Dividing this piece, it was a uh, uh, an offset to a runner. It's going both ways, tight in a cluster, but it'll also run. I find it grows tighter in a cluster where it's moister soil. It's almost as if when you put it in dry soil, it starts moving out. Like if I go out far enough, maybe I'll find a nice moist place where I really belong. And um, you can divide it in the fall before it starts growing, or this is in the fall or in the spring. Geraniums. We talked about geranium roseanne, and I did not bring out the roseanne leaf, uh, roots to show you. But they're the same as this one here. Uh, it's a thickish root. You can see, I'm pretty sure you can see the, the bumps all along the roots that are all going to grow up into separate plants if they get a chance to get away from the mother plant's shade or you can divide off uh, offsets. So I can take the root or I can break away this part right here. Either way, they'll grow. And they're, they're so drought tolerant um, when they're like this that literally I've left them laying around for two weeks during the growing season and then realized they were still laying around and planted them and they still grow. All of those buds develop. Some of the perennial geraniums are a little bit different than others. Um, geranium macrorhizae, the big root geranium, does more layering itself, putting its elbows down and rooting from its elbows above ground, whereas these are doing more of it below ground. But they, they generally are all, <laughs> they're all using the same tactics. Ostrich fern you saw earlier grows by runners underground. Many of the running ferns do that. I hate the running ferns. I like to keep my ferns more under control. Russian sage is a shrub that we grow as a perennial. It's a, quite a woody plant, woody stems with buds on the stems that'll stay there all year. You can cut them down or not as you like. I find that the more that I cut them down hard in the spring, the more that they are encouraged to sprout from the pieces just below ground and they run. Once you cut them down a lot, these pieces turn up and, and run. Sage, most of the perennial sages are, are uh, woody plants too, with amazingly deep roots. Here's the crowns. Each The crowns are all separate. But they come together into this woody root that sometimes will be two feet deep, um, but each of those pieces, its own rosette up at the top, can be cut away from the rest and will grow into a nice vigorous plant. Border jewel, a polygonum that uh, lays itself down to the side and grows. Lavender, we talked about already, puts its elbows down and roots where it makes good contact with moist soil. And you can encourage this by scraping the underside and then pegging that down to make sure that it's pressed against the moist soil. That's what I did to make these offsets of the lavender that I wanted to propagate and have exactly the same lavender. I just took its side branches 
and pegged them down until they formed roots. And later that year, I think I pegged them down in the spring and in the fall, I cut here between this and the mother plant and took a nice little division. Pinks are also a, a subshrub, a, a, a woody plant. Doesn't look like it to you or me, but they are woody. Uh, I love them and they do so well in dry areas. We use a lot of them. Um, their stems are woody and anything that doesn't have roots on it is not gonna grow. I've gotta find the ones that have laid down against soil and are growing roots and then I can clip any of those off and they'll grow. Monkshood grows as a tuber um, at the base of the stem. It forms a tuber. All I need is that tuber and the base of the stem, but you wanna make sure that the tubers are, are sound, that you, they have no squishy parts in them. This one, the top from the stem had become infected. You, you don't wanna cut them apart. I did that to, sh to illustrate for you the difference between the interior of the infected one and the non-infected one. You wanna take the good pieces because this is a bacterial, oh, there's bacterial and fungal infections that the monks would gets, but this is a bacterial infection. Gas plant, I'm pretty sure we showed you this one earlier as an example of, they say you shouldn't move it, but this one was being overgrown by the bird's nest spruce. The client liked it a lot. Buying a new one, they take forever to get that big. I think it took three years to get this big here. So I'm digging it up, trenching around the outside. Trench, trench, trench. Cut, cut, pop up, get down to the ground, drop it a couple of times shake it, getting the soil off so I can see what I'm doing. There's my offsets and buds, and I'm just gonna cut apart and get some separate pieces. I'm using my hand pruners to do this. My dad would kill me if he found out that I was using pruners to, good uh, Falco pruners to cut, but that's what I did. And I cut loose some pieces. all of which will grow. Ended up with one good sized chunk. Said, well, I will cut the bird's nest spruce and prune it back and put this one back in. And they all grew. I'm rinsing it off so that I can see that I've got just, that I haven't taken along any fellow travelers like the pack of Sandra that was growing in with the bird's nest spruce. Black-eyed Susan offsets and I'm going to divide this one every chance I get. And quite often we just get rid of it out of the garden because it's very susceptible to septoria leaf spots. See the purpley brown spots on it, angular sided, that um, affects the plant and affects the stems. The plant gets weaker and blooms less well every year. So take only outside pieces that are clean foliage and get rid of everything else. Iatris are corms. Well, this, the base of the stem forms a corm, a very tight little cluster, little plate like this that you can break up, plant each one separately, new plant. Ta -da. Clematis. Um, I was asked at a class that I was teaching if I could help them. And I said, well, if you're not too far from here, I can stop by your house on the way home. So we first dug the the uh, bellflower, Campanula, away from the base. And then here's the clematis, the main trunk of the clematis. And there, I've cut it because it had roots on two sides. So each of those will grow separately. Uh, this was a side piece that had layered itself. She was quite worried. It was somebody's great aunt's clematis and she was concerned about it, but um, it, uh, every piece grew. Look at how many pieces you end up with. One, two, three, four, six pieces. And if you want more, because each one of these stems, once they you cut them back, they'll grow. They will grow very quickly. They'll bloom the first year. Um, each one of those stems you can pull apart. And if it's a woody stem with its own roots, it's another division. Um, if your clematis isn't doing that, you can take a stem and, and layer it like I layered the lavender, pull it down to the ground, uh, scrape the underside of the stem, 
and get it in good contact with soil. If that means burying it or putting a brick on top of it to hold it down, do that. And make sure that the end of the, the vine or branch is turned upward. And with this growing up and this buried, it's very, very likely to form roots that spring, that summer, sorry. These goldenrod that should be a dwarf goldenrod reverted to a full-size goldenrod. And just like the Brenneras and the variegated daylilies that I'm showing you, we have to, to divide it in order to put in just the dwarf one and get rid of those tall guys who are taking over just the little guys back in. Sea pink, very tight woody crown, pussy's toes, uh, very uh, um, close growing offsets uh, right out of the pot, dividing through the woody crown. Here's the woody crown, each side branch there, deep enough to have some roots of its own. Divided at each pot twice. So we got four pieces for one piece, four pieces for one piece, and planted them to spread them out because they'll cover that much area. If you look on the website, these pictures are shown after they've grown in. And that's it. That's dividing perennials. Uh, this was, has been uh, your bonus chapter four, dividing 50 perennials. Really hope that you'll come back and uh, join us for more webinars because we truly enjoy putting them on. Uh, next week, we're doing the Art of Fall Garden Cleanup. This webinar on dividing has been open to the uh, whole public. We're back to subscribers for the Art of Fall Garden Cleanup. Subscribe. Come be part of this operation. It's just my husband and me. It's just a 40-year labor of love that we're putting out information that we've been gathering together in one place, and we'd like to keep doing it. And it, uh, it is the help of our subscribers and donors that help that uh, enable us to do that. Thanks a lot for being here. Yeah.